I've had the privilege of being married to my best friend, Chris, for the last 28 years. And Chris is not only my husband, but he's my favorite pastor in the PCA, no offense. Um, and I've learned a lot about leadership, serving alongside him, and also serving in my role as coordinator of women's ministries for the PCA. You know, the church needs leaders now more than ever, and the world is clamoring for anybody who would be willing to stand up and fill that gap. But the problem happens when the world and the church look to this exact same place to define what leadership is all about. We look to corporate models, or we often look to cultural trends. And then there's this whole notion of what it means to pick leaders. Do we pick the best, the brightest, the most beautiful, or do we look for the most extroverted or the most experienced kind of people? Biblical leadership is radically different than worldly leadership. In fact, we have to examine a lot of the misconceptions about leadership so we can get down to what it really is. So for instance, um, we have a misconception that leadership is about authority or it's just about decision making or that if we have a title or a position or a role that necessarily makes us a leader. But biblical leadership has absolutely nothing to do with positional leadership. It has everything to do with servant leadership. And it's amazing that um, the world even picks up on that. In fact, popular um, author and TED Talk speaker Simon Sinek wrote a book called Leaders Eat Last. And this is what he said. Leaders are the ones who are willing to give up something for their own for us, their time, their energy, their money, or maybe even the food off their plate. When it matters, leaders choose to eat last. Several years ago, I was having the opportunity to teach about what it means to image God as we exercise our helper design as a woman. So whether it's in the home, the church, or the workplace. And honestly, at the end of the day, I was very tired and very hungry. So I was really excited that the coordinator of the event grabbed me by the arm and she took me over to a table full of women. What I didn't realize, however, was that my talk had caused quite a stir with those women. And the conversation quickly shifted to the fact that they wanted to talk about how they could gain a seat at the table in terms of leadership in the church. And what I saw and what I heard in those women were women who love God. They sincerely love God. They sincerely love his church. And yet they were sincerely misguided and what biblical leadership looks like for men and for women in the church. You see, leadership is not about having a seat at the table. It's about an invitation to serve at the table. And Jesus had a dinner, too, with a lot of zealous disciples. In fact, it was the night before he went to the cross. And they were so zealous that they began to fight about who was the greatest. And Jesus answered their question, with a question, as he often does in the Gospels. He said, who is the greatest? The one who serves or the one who reclines at the table? I am among you as one who serves. You see, Jesus was modeling there that leadership is not just an invitation to serve, but as he would do the next day, an invitation to die. And I get it, dying is scary and painful, but yet it's necessary and glorious for Christ's life to be formed in us. And Jesus talked more about this in Matthew 12, verses 24 through 26. So let me read that for you. Truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. You see, as, lighter, as leaders, we have to die to live, and we have to die to lead. And God calls us to a specific place of dirt. Now, my dirt might be different than your dirt. And over the years, my dirt has looked like marriage, parenting, serving in the church, um, and all the things that I do with women's ministry. And the plot size might get bigger, but the calling does not change. But death is costly, it is sacrificial, it is daily, as Jesus says, as we take up our cross and follow him, and yet it is glorious in the end because, as Jesus just said, as we die, 
we live. So as leaders, as we die, the potential for life-giving leadership just increases because of course leadership can be either life-taking or life-giving. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a leader as somebody who goes before or alongside another person to get them to an intended destination. Well, over the years, Chris and I have been mentored by amazing leaders, uh, many of them the mothers and the fathers of the PCA. And what I've noted about them was there are two different kinds of leaders. There, as the definition says, there's these pace-setting leaders who are way out ahead of us, and we're just trying to keep up. But more often than not, we have been mentored by pilgrim leaders, those who come alongside us. And whatever that season was or whatever plot of dirt that was, they poured their life into us. And the thing that set those leaders apart was where they fixed their eyes. You see, um, as a leader, there can be a lot of end results or destinations. So it, it could be productivity. It could be reaching a goal. It could be what we define as success. But a servant leader, a biblical leader, fixes their eyes on the intended destination of eternity. I mean, these leaders led in light of eternity, and that makes all the difference. And as they exercised this pilgrim leadership, they came alongside us, and that's really what leadership development is. At its core, it's discipleship. So as we were going, they came alongside us, they taught us everything that the Lord has commanded, and they believed the promise that he was gonna be with them to the end of the age, till we got to the end of the destination, to the end of the line. And along the way, leadership development happens, discipleship happens, transformation happens. And so leadership has everything to do with where we fix our eyes. And I don't know about you, but I get really distracted a lot of time as a leader. So some days I wake up and I'm distracted by task and I become a task-driven leader. I mean, I gotta get my to-do list done. And that's all I can see. I don't see people, I see task. Or other days I can be a consumer-driven leader and then I fix my eyes on other people because I want their approval or I want to give them what they want. And no leader ever sets out to be a personality-driven leader. I mean, it's just so subtle. And yet that's when we fix our eyes on ourselves, our own gifts, our own abilities, our own plans, and our own agendas. So we have to lift our eyes. We have to look towards eternity. And I am incredibly thankful, not only for these real life leader mentors that have come along my, my life, but also the biblical ones. And so I'm thankful for Abraham. Uh, he set out, he set out into the unknown. He led his wife, he established his family, but he made it to the destination because he fixed his eyes on a city whose architect and builder is God. And then you got Moses, who's an amazing leader, who was called to lead a bunch of stiff-necked people in the desert it, which, when it seemed like it was forever. And yet he lifted his eyes and he said, show me your glory. And as God put him in the cleft of the rock and he saw his backside, he saw his glory, and then he radiated his glory, his character, to those same stiff-necked people. He radiated his compassionate, patient, loving kindness to those stiff-necked people. And then there's leaders who, in the Bible who just don't look like leaders, like John the Baptist, who was looking, but he was looking for the Messiah. He was looking and looking and looking, and when he saw the Son of Man coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And his response was, he must increase and I must decrease. And then I think about Mary, who when she saw the angel, she was called to die. She died to her fears. She died to her reputation. She died to what her dream was for getting married and establishing a family. And her response was, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And we can't forget Paul, I mean, a leader among leaders who established the leaders of the early church. When those leaders were tired and they were being persecuted, he lifted their eyes and he says, don't look to the things that are seen because the things that are seen are temporary, they're gonna pass away, but look to the unseen, look to the things that are eternal. And that's why as a leader, Paul could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ or follow me as I follow Christ. So I don't, I don't know where you're looking or what you're saying to people as a leader, 
But all I can say after all these years of trying to serve the church is this, that it's really my prayer every day that I would fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter when we get to the end of the destination of my faith. And in this in-between time, I can say I'm a weak leader. But I'm okay with being a weak leader because his grace is sufficient and his power is perfected in weakness. And when I'm weak, he is strong. Thank you.